I realize how unnerving this is for students, teachers, parents, and Vermonters alike. And now that we've identified this was a hoax, my hope is that we can use this energy to come together because unity is the most powerful way to make sure terrorists don't achieve their goals. I want to thank the Vermont State Police, local law enforcement, and emergency response offices across the state for acting so quickly and professionally. Please know my office, the Vermont State Police, the Agency of Education, the Vermont Intelligence Center, and many other state and local partners will continue to monitor this situation closely. And in the days ahead, after all the facts are gathered, we'll debrief on this incident so we can build upon and strengthen our response. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. My name is Jennifer Morrison. I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety, and I'd like to provide you with a summary of today's events. Between 8.30 and 11 o'clock this morning, approximately 21 Vermont law enforcement agencies received calls reporting active shooter situations at local area schools. None of these calls have been determined to be legitimate. The characteristics of these calls are similar in nature and appear to be part of a hoax threat scam, sometimes referred to as swatting. Prior rounds of hoax school threats have spread across the nation but have not previously affected Vermont K through 12 schools. Over the summer of 22, multiple Vermont post-secondary institutions fell victim to a similar hoax scam. And again, none of these calls were found to be legitimate. Schools that have received calls as of 11 o'clock today include Missiscoy Valley Union High School in Highgate, Vermont, Enosburg High School in Enosburg, North Country Union Junior High School, Derby, Vermont, Essex High School in Essex, Rice Memorial High School in South Burlington, Colchester High School in Colchester, and Montpelier High School in Montpelier, Otter Valley Union High School in Brandon, Arlington Memorial High School in Arlington, and Brattleboro High School in Brattleboro, Christ the King High School in Rutland, Vermont, Fairhaven High School in Fairhaven, United Christian Academy in Newport, Vermont, North Country Union High School in Derby, Grace Christian School in Bennington, St. Albans City Elementary School, Milton High School, Randolph Union High School in Randolph, Middlebury Union High School in Middlebury, and the Alberg Community School in Alberg. State or local law enforcement has responded to all of these locations and determined that they are safe and no violence has taken place. Calls are being received at the main line of a dispatch center, not the emergency 911 line. The Vermont Intelligence Center is not aware of any other states in the region or nation that have received similar hoax threats today, but we have shared the details of these hoax calls with our national Fusion Center Alliance partners for situational awareness. We are aware that other states, Maine and New Hampshire in particular, have experienced similar hoax calls in recent months. Swatting is the false reporting of an ongoing emergency or threat of violence intended to prompt an immediate and or large response from law enforcement and other first responders. The types of calls can include, but are not limited to, bomb threats, active shooter, hostage situations, mental health emergencies, home invasions, or robberies. Often, law enforcement response is substantial, and upon investigation, it is learned that there is no real emergency. I want to be clear that these incidents are criminal in nature and are covered by multiple state and federal violations. About six weeks ago, the Department of Public Safety, our School Safety Center, and Agency of Education partners shared information about hoax calls targeted at schools in other parts of the country. The Agency of Education sent a message to schools and school districts alerting them to this type of criminal activity. To date, none of these calls has been credible. That being said, we respond to all calls as if they were real. 
law enforcement will continue to respond to each incident swiftly and seriously, and we will continue to update details as they are confirmed. These incidents are under investigation. We will engage all available investigative and prosecutorial resources at the state and federal level. These types of calls could continue, and we urge anyone who receives such a call to take it seriously and immediately report it to your local law enforcement authorities. Do not just dismiss a threatening call as a hoax. I will now turn things over to Mr. Rob Evans, our liaison to the School Safety Center, who is joining us remotely. Thanks, Commissioner, and, and thanks for the invite to, to participate in, in the briefing. You know, my role as the state's school safety liaison officer is to partner with not only our schools, but our first response community and also the school safety stakeholders across the state to ensure that we're prepared to respond to an incident like this. And as the commissioner mentioned, you know, unfortunately, this is not something new nationally that we have experienced. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I'm sure it's not the last time we are going to experience this. And what's scary is not only the initial call that comes in and the identity associated with those that receive those calls, but the unintended consequences with a large number of emergency first response resources that are responding to the scene of a potentially violent incident like this, and all of those stressors that come to that community when those resources are deployed. One of the things that the Vermont School Safety Center tries to do is to share best practices and resources so that schools are prepared to respond to incidents like this. And I'm very grateful for the collaborations that the state has you know, within minutes of, of the School Safety Center being notified about an incident that was taking place at Slate Valley by Superintendent Provoso Farrell. You know, we were on the phone with uh, the Vermont Superintendents Association, members from the ATC of Education and the Department of Public Safety and a variety of other emergency first response organizations to inform them about what was taking place and to get a plan in place to provide additional resources and technical support for folks that may need that assistance. I'm also very proud of the relationship we have with the Vermont Intelligence Center. Again, they have a 30,000 foot view globally of incidents that not only may be taking place in Vermont, but across the country to try to give us the accurate data so that we can appropriately respond to incidents like this. One of the things that I want to highlight, though, is you when know, we think about the response, folks need to be thinking about the recovery as well. This has a variety of unintended mental health consequences for faculty, staff, students, and our parent community as well. And it will be important for our schools and our communities to make sure that folks know where to get those additional resources if they need help you know, recovering from an incident like this. Over the next couple of days, the School Safety Center will do, do its due diligence to look at uh, these incidents and provide you know, any operational um, improvements or things that we might want to do if we have to respond to incidents like this in the future. And I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Um, you know, as the governor said, uh, there's no doubt these kinds of incidents are very serious in our schools, and they. They have an impact uh, even when the threats aren't verified. Uh, as Rob sort of described uh, the inner workings of our relationship in Vermont, we are fortunate to have uh, well-established protocols and relationships to engage in these kinds of events. So our, our schools really are prepared. Uh, they're working with their local law enforcement, with state and community partners as we speak uh, to respond appropriately to these incidents as they arise. Um, they're working through their emergency plans, which are a requirement in the state, uh, more or less, and, and our districts have well-established plans. The goal, first and foremost, is to make sure students and staff are safe. Um, as Commissioner Morrison mentioned, uh, right now we're releasing a list of schools, but we just wanted to mention to parents uh, that even though your school might not be on that list, uh, your school might be reacting to this context by taking some precautionary measures of an abundance of caution, so be prepared for that. As Rob mentioned, uh, we will debrief on this incident uh, after it's over so we can learn to improve uh, on our protocols. Uh, but in closing, I just want to express my appreciation and gratitude uh, to our Vermont school leaders, our partners in law enforcement, Vermont School Safety Center, our community leaders uh, for their hard work today in responding uh, on behalf of our schools to ensure their health and safety. So thank you. We'll now uh, turn it over for questions. Uh, have you identified any potential motivation for this? 
Commissioner? Uh, right now it's still an active investigation and uh, we don't know the specific motivation. The assumption, if, if the assumption that these are swatting calls is, is true, this is terrorism to invoke fear and chaos in a community. So I can think of no other motivation other than some depraved person or entity perpetrates these calls to upset communities and to create havoc. Um, can you tell us what specific statutory violations may have occurred by, by this, whatever happened? Yeah, there's multiple actually related to um, uh, foreign and domestic terrorism to false alarms. There's there's a variety of statutes. If if you're if any of you are looking to publish those, we can get you the list. But it's there's a lot that we could pull from, and it would really depend on what the investigation reveals. You know, at, at, at the conclusion of it. Uh, but if that's useful to you, you can uh, email Adam Silverman, and he we can put together a list for you of the applicable ones that may intersect with this incident. Can you tell us exactly what the college reported? And was it the same thing at each school, the same report? Yeah, again, this is an active investigation. And just like in any investigation, we wouldn't tell you things that would only be known to the caller and to the people receiving the call, right? But I can tell you that um, there are very similar messages, and they are possibly um, uh, technologically created messages uh, that are being shared to all of these different agencies. Um, so we, we'll know more after we have time to analyze. We're still in the gather information gathering phase, um, and it is very likely that we'll have more information to share after we have an opportunity to analyze and, and sit down and think through all of the messages and, make, and, and listen to each one individually. What do you mean by technologically created? It could be a robocall. You probably get a lot of them at your house. But was, the, was it a message that was left on the system, or was it the, the person picked up the phone and heard in real time? I, I don't know about all 21 calls. I know that I believe 20 of them went to local police dispatch centers, and one of them went to a town clerk uh, in a place in a town where there is not a local police agency. Are you investigating the possibility that there was a, a reason this, the 21 schools were targeted specifically? Uh, we're not that we're not that far in this investigation. This literally is in the first hours of the investigation, so we'll have more information on that as things develop. Did they all all mm -hmm. Right. Oh yes, and also that it's very likely that this is not the end of the calls. If we have two hundred schools, if we have two hundred schools, only ten percent have received a call at this point. So, do they all involve a threat of shooting? Yes. I know it's tough with technology nowadays because you can kind of manipulate a lot of things, but are there any preventative measures maybe in the future or some research you guys can do to try to maybe eliminate this from happening in the future? I think that's more of a uh, industry regulation uh, question about why are robocalls allowed? Why is spoofing of phone numbers allowed? The technology can do it, but we allow it to happen. So I think there are other implications other than investigative angles to this, um, and regulation may be one of them. Commissioner, do we know if there were different voices on the phones coming from different people, or was this one person or one? Again, I haven't listened to the calls yet, and the um, initial feedback that we received from the VIC is that it is a similar voice on all of the calls, but we, we need some time to dig into these. And Commissioner, and maybe Governor, if you could weigh in too. You know, we mentioned that this has happened in other states, and swatting isn't necessarily new, but is this something that, that maybe schools or our systems should get accustomed to? And, hey, this happens. Yeah, let's hope that schools don't have to get accustomed to something like this happening in our state or any state. Um, we need to try and put a stop to this in any way possible, um, but I don't believe that they should get, this shouldn't be normalized. Like, that's why we take every single threat seriously, like it's the real thing. Um, because once it gets normalized, things happen. Can you talk about some of the public safety consequences that can derive from swatting? Obviously, there wasn't a shooting that took place, but my understanding is that 
uh, sure. the, the response itself can sometimes result in some bad outcomes. Sure. I mean, you're asking me a hypothetical question, so I'm going to give hypothetical answers. But whenever you, uh, we receive a call of an active shooter in any environment, but particularly in a school, you're going to get a lot of police cars driving quickly to the scene. You're going to get ambulances and fire apparatus staging, but they're also going to be driving rapidly to get to the scene. Um, there, there, there's an inherent risk any time that you bring a large response into what's a busy area. These calls started at 8.30, which is the beginning of the school day, right? So there's a lot of people coming in for drop-off. Um, there's a lot of people coming and going. So there's clearly the possibility of traffic crashes. Um, but I think the, the consequence, those are, those are like physical consequences of bringing a lot of resources to a place, I think what we really need to be most concerned with is what does this do to the sense of safety and security for our students, our staff, our parent community? Um, what does this do to our, the social contract? Like if, as the governor said, if we normalize this kind of behavior, we're, t we're just keep stepping back a w further away from civility and decency that the governor spoke about in his press conference on Tuesday. I mean. We need to be focusing really hard on things that bring social cohesion and strengthen the fabric that is the basis, the foundation of our community. And the incident that he referred to on Tuesday, this type of incident, uh, is counterintuitive to that. And it makes people afraid. And when people are afraid, they don't do their best thinking. And, and so we really need to make sure people understand that we are responding, we are there to help keep them safe, and that not just to respond to things, but also to prevent future incidents from happening. So we gotta restore a sense of safety and stability, civility, and a good, solid environment, whether that's in our schools or in our communities, so that we can all, all be our best version of ourselves, right? What advice do you have for parents, and for maybe for them being able to, to talk to their kids about this? I can only answer that as a mom because I don't have a degree in anything like that. Um, but as a longtime practitioner and as a mom, I can say it depends on the age of your kids. It depends on their emotional maturity and their uh, how you've talked to them in the past. If you're someone like I was who was very upfront with my kids and talked about tough issues from a young age, I would just be honest with them and let them do most of the talking. Um, but. If it, it really would depend on what type of child you have and, and how you gauge their ability to absorb information that can be very upsetting. Uh, but I, as a mom and as a longtime practitioner, I would, I would never say, don't talk to them about it. Try to pretend it didn't happen. Um, and I'm confident in my, you have somebody here who can answer that better? Yeah, please. Yes, it's a great question. Um, first and foremost, parents, um, your children need to be told that they are safe and that they're going to be okay. That's, that's the first thing most children will be, and even adolescents would be concerned about in this case. I would recommend that you not, uh, that you definitely do talk about it. Um, you want to be developmentally appropriate, which means you, you don't want to give um, significant details to younger children, which will just stress them out and make them more um, anxious about that. You also, though, don't want to just put it on, you know, uh, shove it under the rug and not talk about it because that can actually be um, even more um, scary for children. Um, the schools will be having um, conversations about this. Um, they will be actually deploying uh, mental health partners to assist with this as well. So I would also say definitely reach out to your school um, and they should probably be providing you some assistance with uh, messaging to your children as well. Are there any other resources available for those students or teachers or administrators that had to go through this today, or is it just going to be uh, that specifically? Yeah, I would say uh, you know that that resource network is fairly comprehensive in schools, and uh, to under underscore uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher's point, you know, our schools are community schools, so that's something that needs to be leveraged in this context. Uh, this harms the community, including the school community, and that's also where we can begin to do the healing as well. Uh, I'm just wondering, 
the commissioner had said that only one one call went into a municipal office. I was just wondering why, what you in your professional experience, why you would go into a town office as opposed to going into the school? And is that anything that all Burke residents should be concerned about? Why you went into the municipal office there instead of the school? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't know why my, it went to the school other than what the commissioner said, which is likely that uh, there is no primary law enforcement entity in Albert, but uh, that's just me taking a guess at it. So I have no factual basis to determine why it went to the town clerk. But there are other schools that have in that primary law enforcement and their town's municipal police or anything like that. I mean, it's just an effort to cover uh, the voice of the person that was making the call, although it sounds like it's a robocall. Yeah, it's too early to determine, uh, Mike, uh, you know, the reason and the, the schools and the locations and how they came in and why they came in. We can't, we can't determine that right now. You'll follow up. Absolutely. Thank you. But while we're on the phones, I think there's one other person with their hand up right now, Gregory. Yeah. Uh, if I understand you correctly in that these calls are coming in dispatch centers and police are responding to the schools without the schools even knowing the reports that made? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but uh, 20 of the 21 calls came into police dispatch centers and we responded to those calls as if they were active shooter situations. I mean, are, are police showing up to the schools and the schools are completely blindsided by the police showing up or do they get a phone call saying, hey, we have police on the way, what's going on? Like, I don't know in these specific incidents, but maybe Rob, I don't know if you want to answer that question. Uh, I do know that in at least one area that local law enforcement got the call and the first thing local law enforcement did was put a call into the superintendent of schools in that school district. I'm only going to assume that that's the way it happened in the majority of our schools and school districts. But as the secretary said, that's one of the things that we will be debriefing. We'll find out more information about that. Okay, thank you. Um, one other quick question here. It, this may be for the governor, uh, it might be for the colonel, I'm not sure. Can you speak to the balance of you know raising awareness of what's going on and, and making a public statement and, and balancing that with <clears throat> Obviously, you know, creating headlines probably exactly what this perpetrator wants. Yeah, you know, we're very aware um, what this looks like and this accomplishes some of their goals. But with all of us here together, working in unison um, and trying to, to be uh, transparent, uh, I think that that trumps anything uh, that uh, the disadvantage of doing so. We want to communicate this. We want to make sure that kids and families know um, we're, we're on this. We're, we're here to help and we're going to do everything we can to prevent anything like this in the future. So um, we're, again, well aware um, that this may have uh, helped them accomplish the goal by highlighting uh, the situation. But, uh, but again, if we show that we're on top of this, um, give confidence to schools and kids and and families, um, I think that that's uh, that's the right uh, right approach, and that's why we're here today. Did the calls that precipitated the police response just say that there was an active shooter, or did it indicate that there were victims that were shooting as well? I, I just want to stress again that this is really preliminary, and we have not heard any of the calls yet. So, um, one call specified that there were two students shot. Other calls were more, much more generic in that there was a shooting or an active shooter in the school environment. While there was no actual shootings or bombs, there were 21 different locations called in that resources were expanded to those locations. If this did actually happen, was legitimate, are you guys confident you had enough resources to spread across those 21 locations to handle events like that if they did happen? Because it is a that, uh, massive area, 21 locations. Tw 21 simultaneous active shootings would strain our resources of that, I'm confident. I'm also confident that if handled appropriately, you can confront the threat and hopefully uh, neutralize it relatively quickly. But yeah, that, I mean, there's no way around it. We're a small state with not that many resources all in. 
Uh, we would be activating every resource available and we would get there and address all 21 incidents, but 21 simultaneously would be, would be difficult. But that's why it's important to do some of the things we've been doing over the last uh, number of years. We learned a lot from the pandemic about utilizing uh, some of uh, like law enforcement and, and other agencies and departments uh, so that we work together, uh, whether it's uh, uh, agency of Natural Resources with the Game Wardens or uh, Department of Motor Vehicles with uh, their inspectors, uh, even Liquor Lottery with their inspectors. They, we have sworn officers in a lot of different locations. So we're always, this is a high priority for us and we will use every bit of resource we have in order to, uh, to stay on top of this. So you can bet um, that um, when this, if this unfolded, uh, we'd have the sheriffs local law enforcement, state police, uh, any federal uh, agencies that might be in the area, as well as uh, those across different state agencies. So it may stress us, um, but we would, uh, this is a high priority for us. Commissioner, would you see an opportunity to work with cell phone providers and uh, see if you can access information that way? We already do work with cell phone providers and we do access information in a variety of ways. Um, so we certainly will be working with them to the degree possible and I believe the Attorney General's office is going to be available to help us uh, with some of these investigative avenues, but the, the reality is we already do work with cell phone providers and almost, literally almost every case nowadays involves somebody's information on their cell phone, right? right. So, so we do have a very good working relationship with cell phone providers and that will obviously be key in this case. Is there any communication with the hospitals in the areas where the uh, threats were made to prepare them for what you thought you were responding to? I, I don't have that information. I'll turn to the colonel and ask if you have that now. No, no there's I have no indication that we were in communication with hospitals. I, I will say anecdotally, um, we did hear that uh, some of the some of the hospitals uh, heard somehow, some way, and were preparing. How long after uh, the simultaneous calls did you identify that it was SWAT? Uh, how long did that process take? Uh, yeah, I, I think it, uh, fairly quickly uh, it, it, we were able to determine that it was likely a SWATing event. When you have multiple calls of this nature happening at the same time, the odds of that being real are very low. Um, and then we were able to ascertain it within minutes that after analyzing the calls, uh, the VIC was able to ascertain that it was likely a swatting event. But it doesn't relieve us of our responsibility to respond to all these sites, which we did. Uh, so I want to thank all the law enforcement agencies and fire and EMS agencies out there that did respond to ensure that these schools were safe. And we will continue to do that if they come in. In terms of, oh, in terms of alerting the school districts, was it within, say, a half an hour? Do you know that information at all or a specific time frame? In terms of us determining that it was likely swatting? Yeah, just kind of get a time frame in terms of when that actually happened. We're, we're, doing, we're doing a breakdown of all the calls, the times that they came in and how they came in. So we'll have, we'll have an assessment of that at some point. Um, but it was, as soon as it reached me, which was very quickly, it was already assumed that it was a swatting event. Gotcha. Any connection to the bomb threat at the Berlin Mall yesterday? Uh, nothing that I know of. There are any callers on the call, any reporters on the call who have a question, please just raise your hand and we'll call on you. We got one Rebecca. Oh, Wilson Ring. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for putting this together so quickly. Can you talk about how there have been a number of these SWAT events in a number of different locations over, I don't know, what time period? I, um, I, uh, in your, to your first question, I do not know what the outcome of the other swatting events were in, in the country. Uh, they're likely all still under investigation. And to your second question, uh, it's too early in the investigation to determine where this originated from. Uh, a lot of these swatting events and robocalls are, do originate uh, historically from 
foreign countries, uh, and they are difficult to track at times. But we're working closely with our federal partners to, with, at the FBI, uh, and we will we will do everything in our power to identify who was responsible for these calls. Thank you. Is there a racial element in, in any of the phone calls? Is that an aspect of this? Right. No. None that we know of. No. So is, are the feds running point on this investigation? Uh, we're working together on it. Gregory? Uh, some of these schools have school resource officers, obviously. Some don't. How did that uh, come into play as far as the response goes? Uh, Rob, do you want to take that one? Yeah, for now, just uh, specifics on, you know, how many schools had school resource officers on duty at the time. Obviously, if there's a school resource officer who's there, when these calls come in, they're an integral part of, of the response. But as folks know, you know, we don't have a large number of school resource officers across the state. The majority of our schools across the state do not have those resources that are there full time, you know, in a school and in the school community. But if they are there, then obviously they are a part of the immediate response that will take place. Uh, so a, a follow-up on that for the, uh, the politicians in the room. Is this an illustration of a need for more schools to have those officers? Again, I think I'll take that at this point. Um, and these are discussions we'll have, I'm sure, in some of the committees. We have a number of legislators here. I want to thank the uh, pro tem and the speaker uh, for being part of this. Um, but we'll have these discussions uh, as we move through the legislative session. And once we debrief on, on what happened this morning, uh, we'll be able to come to some conclusions about what we can do better, what we should be doing, and uh, so that we can be um, as prepared. I think we're pretty, pretty we, I have to say, I mean, when you think about uh, the order of events today, when we first learned about this at 8.30, and we're having a press conference right now at noon, and we were able to determine uh, that this was a swatting event very quickly and to communicate with everyone that, who we communicated with i think we handled this pretty well thus far and, and this is um, through our efforts with the vermont state police uh, the schools um, first responders across the board uh, so if there's any one thing uh, that we can gain from this is Again, we're all together in this. And when it comes to our kids in our schools, um, we'll do whatever we need to do uh, to protect them and keep them safe and keep them informed. So, um, so again, we might be able to do something a, a bit better, but for the most part, um, I, think, uh, I think everyone acted appropriately. Mm -hmm. The team's gotta get to work. Okay, with that, we thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.